Let's consider the dihedral group, D8, sometimes written D4. This group is going to be the symmetries of the square. We have three questions. First, I want to find all conjugacy classes for our group. Then, we'll verify the class equation. Finally, I want to find all subgroups and determine which ones are normal. Now, we start with the square. So we'll label the vertices one through four going counterclockwise. There are going to be eight symmetries. So to do our counting, there are going to be four corners that could send one to. Once we know that, there are going to be two ways we can orient the square. So we're going to have four times two equals eight symmetries. Now, let's list our elements. My first element is to do nothing. So it's the symmetry that just lets the square stay where it is. That's going to be my identity element. So that has order one. Now, we can consider the rotations first. So we call R the element that rotates our square 90 degrees counterclockwise. So one goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to four, four goes to one. In permutation notation, you can write that as this cycle here. Now, R has order four. If I rotate by 90 degrees four times, that gets me back to where I started. The inverse of R, okay, that's gonna be rotate by 90 degrees clockwise. One goes to four, four goes to three, three goes to two, two goes to one. So we'll have the cycle in permutation notation we know since R has order four, R inverse is gonna be equal to R cubed. Now, the elements that are left are gonna have order two. We have one more rotation, can rotate by 180 degrees, doesn't matter what direction. So that'll send one to three, two to four. Okay, so that's R squared, and we can write that as approximately two cycles, one, three, and two, four. What's left are gonna be reflections. Now, if I reflect in the x-axis, we'll switch one and four and two and three. I'm gonna call that element G. We flip in the y-axis, we'll switch one and two and three and four. You can verify in terms of G and R that that's G times R squared. If we flip in the diagonals, so if we fix the line y equals x, so it's fixing one and three, we're gonna switch two and four. Then you can check that that's g times r cubed. Finally, if we fix the line y equals minus x, we'll fix two and four, and then we're gonna switch one and three. That element's gonna be g times r. So we have our eight elements. When we compute, we want to avoid using the permutation notation. Instead, let's look at the generators and relations for D8. So we'll have G squared as the identity, R the fourth is the identity, and then if I take R, conjugate by G, out comes R inverse. Since G squared is the identity, G is equal to G inverse. So what our relation here says, I want to take R times G, move G to the other side. The penalty is gonna be that you have to switch the R to an R inverse. That'll work for any power of R. Now, how should we think of this relation here? Well, you could just grind it out in permutation notation, and it'll turn out to be true. Better way, let's think of D8 as acting on the complex numbers. So. We can think of our square as being centered at the origin in the complex plane. What's happening with each element? Well, G is our flip in the x-axis. So that could be complex conjugation. So it's gonna send Z to Z bar. For R, if I rotate by 90 degrees counterclockwise, that's the same as multiplying by I. So if you think about it, we take the point one, that's gonna be on the positive x-axis. 
we multiply by i, that goes to i, which is on the positive y-axis. We just rotate it by 90 degrees. If I take the point i, multiply by i, I get a minus 1. So this point on the positive y-axis is going to rotate down to the negative x-axis. So we can see for okay, this two points here, we're going from here to here. Now, let's apply our conjugate of R to an element Z in the complex plane. First, we're going to apply G inverse. That's the same as G. So we complex conjugate, we send Z to Z bar. Next, we apply R, so I multiply by I. Then, we're going to take I Z bar and complex conjugate the whole thing. Now, if I take the complex conjugate of a product, that's the same as the product of the complex conjugates. So z bar is going to go back to z, i goes to minus i, and then it's easy to show that multiplying by minus i is the same as acting by r inverse. So that's going to show our relation. Now, let's use this to compute conjugacy classes. So the idea using gr in our relation could be a little bit cleaner than using the permutation notation. Now, the conjugacy class for the element x, I'm just going to take all elements of the form yx, y inverse, where we let y range over all elements in dA. First class, we have the identity. So that always goes into a class by itself. Then, Let's look at rotations. So we're going to have r to the k, where k is equal to 1, 2, or 3. What can happen here? Well, if we conjugate by another rotation, say r to the l, okay, all of these elements commute. So the r of the l goes away with the r of the minus l. We get our original element back. If we conjugate by g times r of the l, remember, if I take the inverse of a product, we reverse the order, take the inverses. So what happens here, we're going to have all powers of r on the inside. That'll collapse to r of the k. Then, if I want to push the g inverse, which is the same as g, past the r of the k, we penalize by turning the r of the k into the r to the minus k. Then the g's go away. So I'm left with r of the minus k. Now, what can happen here? Well, if we take r of the 1, okay, our rotation by 90 degrees counterclockwise, we're going to have r of the 1 and r of the minus 1. So we'll have r itself and r cubed. Now note, in this case, these elements are both of order 4, so that's a check on our work. For a given conjugacy class, all the elements in your class have to have the same order. Now, if I consider r squared, so it's rotation by 180 degrees. Note, we'll have r squared and r to the minus 2. Since r to the fourth is the identity, that means r squared equals r to the minus 2, and we only get one element in this class. Now let's consider reflections. So we'll let x be equal to g times r to the k. If I conjugate by a rotation, some r to the l, we'll take our g push it to the left. The penalty is to change r of the l to r of the minus l. Then I'm left with g times r to the k minus 2l. If we conjugate by another reflection, g times r of the l, we might take the inverse of that. Remember, we put the inverse on each term, reverse the order. So we'll have r of the minus l, g inverse, but g inverse is just g. Go take our second g, push it to the left. So I'll change the r of the l to the r of the minus l, and then the g's go away. So what we're left with, we'll have r of the k minus 2l times g, and then if I push this g all the way to the left, I get g times r raised to the minus k plus 2l. Now, as we try out different k's and l's, what'll come out? First, we'll have the class for g. This is going to be g and g r squared. So those are the reflections in the x-axis and the y-axis. 
Then, if we consider class four G times R, we'll get G times R and G times R cubed. So those are our reflections in y equals x and y equals minus x. Then you'll note there are no elements left. So that covers all conjugacy classes. Now, the class equation, all this says, the conjugacy classes partition our group. So that says the order of the group is gonna be equal to, okay, order of the center plus the sum of the orders for the classes with more than one element. So, if we take a look, what do we have? Well, for the classes with exactly one element, we'll have E and R squared. Then the remaining classes have two elements in each. So we have the eight equals one plus one, which is two, plus two, plus two, plus two, class equation holds. Now the thing to note, the center is just gonna be the union of the singleton classes. So if you have only one element in your class, that means that element belongs to the center. Okay, to see that if X is in your center, we consider conjugation on X. Well, since X is in the center, we can pass elements through it, so the Y and Y inverse go away. Only thing you're ever gonna get out of there is X itself. Let's recall where the class equation comes from. So, we're gonna have a group G we let it act on itself by conjugation. So here, in our group action, G is the group and G is the space. Then, we can consider orbits. So if we fix a point X in our space, we apply all elements of G, that gives us the orbit of X. Now, in our case, we're looking at conjugation so our orbit is gonna be a conjugacy class. For this next part, this is just something you should verify. If we take all elements of the group that leave our point X fixed, call that the stabilizer of X in our group, that's a subgroup. For the action of conjugation, stabilizer of point X is just gonna be the centralizer of X. So if I wanna calculate the number of elements in a conjugacy class, I can take the order of the group, divide by the order of the centralizer. So you should go back and verify that for all the conjugacy classes that we found. Finally, to show the class equation, we note if we have a group action, the orbits always partition our space. In this case, that means our conjugacy classes are always gonna partition our group. If we take all the singleton classes and lump them together, that gives us the center, and then we have the class equation. Now, let's look for subgroups in D8. Of course, we always have the trivial subgroup and D8 itself, so we won't write those down. Now, we're gonna have five subgroups of order two, so you just take the identity element and your favorite element of order two, that gives you a subgroup. In this case, we only have one normal subgroup. So that's given by the center. So here, we're taking E and R squared, rotation by 180 degrees. One thing to note about a normal subgroup, okay, not only do the conjugacy classes partition the group, they're gonna partition every normal subgroup. So if you take a look at the definition, if I have a normal subgroup N, if I take any element N and N, take any X in our group, we conjugate, we get back into our subgroup N. So that means the whole entire conjugacy class for N lives inside of the subgroup. If you notice, for our normal subgroup here, E is in a conjugacy class all by itself, and so is R squared. If we look at the others, each of these elements belongs to a conjugacy class with two elements, so we have to break them classes up to make subgroups here. Finally, we have three subgroups of order four. Now, these are always normal, okay? In this case, they're all index two. If I take eight divided by four, I get two. That automatically implies normal. 
Now, let's take a look. So if we take the rotations, so these are just gonna be our powers of R, you'll note that this breaks up into three conjugacy classes. Okay, so it's normal. Then, if we take okay, our elements here, these are gonna be the flips in y equals x, y equals minus x, that we throw in rotation by 180 degrees. That'll give us a subgroup. And again, it breaks up into conjugacy classes for G. Then finally, if we take subgroup with flipping the x-axis, flipping the y-axis, and our rotation by 180 degrees, get another subgroup. And again, it's a sum of conjugacy classes of G.